Thank you very much for coming. My name is Bruce Momgen. I'm one of the Postgres core team members. I work for Enterprise DB. Um, many of you who have been here before already know many of these things, but I have to say them anyway for those who were not here. Um, this presentation, along with about 30 others, is at that website right here. Um, in fact, this website I uh, enabled on my website about an hour ago. So if you want to follow along, you are very well able to download this PDF and follow along as I speak. Um, fortunately, there will be a recording of this, so I'm excited uh, that I, once the recording comes up, hopefully I'll get an email or somebody will tell me about it, and then uh, we can, I can link to it from my web page. You'll see some, not only do I have 30, 30 presentations on there, but also there are, many of them have recordings next to them. So you, there's a little tab, and you can open it up, and you can see the recordings and where I've spoken, where I've given each talk. That way I don't repeat stuff, uh, which is not good for me or the audience. Um, this presentation is fairly unusual. Uh, what this presentation actually is is inspired by a uh, blog, a series of blog posts that I put out about three months ago relating to the handling of nulls. Uh, have any of you read any of those blog posts? Great. OK, so for those of you who have read the blog post, there's going to be kind of some additional analysis of some of the issues, and I think some of the discussion will be interesting. Um, but, but I will admit that many, much of the content is directly from that blog post. What's really interesting about, the, about doing it the way I did it was, A, it was a series of, of 11 blog posts that spanned probably three weeks. And what was really neat was I got feedback as I was doing it because, of course, I use Discuss so people can comment on my blogs. Uh, you might have noticed there was a keynote from Discuss this morning. Um, that's not why I chose it. Actually, it was just the best solution. Um, and, and effectively, uh, what was neat was I was able to kind of improve the, the blog and improve the content as I got comments from the people who were basically commenting on the blog post. So there's sort of a, a, a combination. Hey, anyone here actually comment on the blogs that made up this series? Because then you would be sort of an author of the, anyway. I'm sure there's somebody at PG Con who did. So let's talk about this particular blog post, this particular presentation. Uh, the reason I was inspired to do it is because ha being somebody who's on the Postgres mailing list all the time, there is a continual kind of difficulty in working with nulls. Um, in fact, that inspired you know, the title, which is a question, you know, nulls make things easier. You know, basically, was this supposed to help me? Like, you're trying to help me with this? Um, a lot of people are very frustrated about the way nulls behave. They, they find it very confusing. I will stay up front, it is confusing. And as we get to the end, I think we'll start to see sort of a pattern of what's emerging. But the bottom line is that the pattern that's emerged is basically, eh, I kind of get it, but there is no overarching single system that, that, that you can uh, sort of place upon nulls and say, here's the one fact I need to remember about nulls, and everything else will fall into place. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I'm even going to explain why it doesn't work that way, but let's get started um, kind of to get, to get going. Uh, any questions before we get started? Again, I do take questions from the audience or those of you who were not in my tutorial. So um, I'm, 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 I'm excited. Let's get going. What's null? Now, we have a null uh, in English. Uh, null means nothing. Uh, it basically just means void. There is sort of a confusion of how to represent that, right? Is it a hole? Is it, is it nothing? Is it a blank slide, right? Um, there's sort of how do you describe nothing with something because you have to use something to describe nothing, right? Um, and, and in English, you know, p it, people don't get so confused, OK? Um, there is the concept of nulls in various procedural languages. SQL is not a procedural language. It's a declarative language. But in procedural languages, you do have the concept of null, particularly in C-based languages, Java being one of the better known ones. Um, and it's, of course, C++ and, and other sort of C-derived languages, you have the concept of null when you're assigning a value to a pointer that doesn't point to anything. Uh, and that's pretty easy to understand. You've got a pointer. It's not a data value. It's a pointer. And you're pointing to something that doesn't exist. Um, that, that's pretty easy to describe. It's pretty easy to have like a little diagram. You have a box, little arrow. There's an X on the arrow. It doesn't go anywhere. 
right? That's pretty easy to get. Um, where it becomes confusing, frankly, is, is in data. Because unlike a pointer, where you know, the, you know the value either points to a memory location or points to nothing, okay? In data, you, don't, you aren't dealing with pointers. You're dealing with a container. You're dealing with a container that normally holds a value, right? You don't have pointers in SQL. So you, you have a container. It normally contains a value. And now we have the challenge of representing no value or nothing, OK? And that's probably the first thing that, that kind of is, is the bender. Again, when you're dealing with pointers, it's kind of easy to say it points to something, it points to nothing. That's pretty easy to understand. When you have a container, and you have to represent that container as containing nothing in the container, how do you do that? Well, um, in fact, we do, that, we do that with nulls. And the way Postgres store null, stores nulls internally, in fact, is very similar to the way you'd expect. Uh, we don't actually store, like for example, if you have an integer, and that integer field is null, Integer is normally four bytes in Postgres, right? Or eight bytes if you do a big int. But if the value is null, we don't store four bytes. We don't store eight bytes. We have a separate area in the row which identifies which of the bits, which of the row, which of the columns is null, which of the fields is null. So if you have three integer columns in a table and you're looking at a specific row and the middle one is null, we store the value for field one, column one. In the row, we store the value for column three in the row. And then we have a bitmap over here, which says, by the way, slot number two, we're going to set that bit high. And that bit indicates that that second field, that second column for that row doesn't have a value in it. Okay, So even in Postgres, the idea of representing nothing internally, we have to create a separate bitmap to handle it. There's some performance reasons for that. Of course, if you have a row that's, it's, it's mostly nulls, which does happen. We actually talked about this a little bit on Tuesday when we had the tutorial. Effectively, you're now looking at a null bitmap with 1,000 bits. You're not looking at 1,000 empty rows or whatever. Okay. Um, but why do we need this thing? Why do we need this thing in SQL that we call nulls? Well. Effectively, as much as people bellyache about it, it's harder if you don't have it than if you have it. So as much confusion as I'm going to show you in the future slides, where you look at it and you're saying, why did they do that? Why does it do it that way? Why am I having to learn about nulls? How many of you have been sort of surprised by null behavior in the past? Yeah, OK, I got a lot of hands there, OK? So the question is, well, why are we surprised? Why can't we make it so we're not surprised, right? Uh, the bottom line is we need to represent this don't have a value, this nothing in the data. Why? Because if you don't have it, it becomes a problem to represent your data. Strings, usually if you don't have a, data, a value, you can put like single quotes or zero length string. And that's, a, that's like, I don't have a value there. It's not the same as null, but I could, we could probably get away with it and, not, and never have invented nulls in the, in the first place. OK, maybe. I'm not sure we could have. But, but if we, everything was a string, we might have gotten away in SQL without nulls. But where it becomes a really problem is all the other fields. right? Everything's not a string. Um, numerics, like what do you put in a field if you don't, you know, what do you put in a field that you don't want to value in? right? I don't know, how, I'm, I'm sure many of you work with databases that didn't have nulls, and you start to get into the special value, minus 100, minus 99. One, minus one, zero. And it's a different special value in every field. And then, then we have to encode those special values in your application. And you have to remember that the special value for this field is this, and the special value for this field is that. And obviously, that doesn't work well. Okay. Um, not only is it a problem with your application, but the database doesn't know your special value. It doesn't know that a minus 99 over here and a minus 99 over there aren't the same, because hey, they're both minus 99, right? Um, but there's actually some behavioral changes that we need to represent in SQL when we're specifying something we don't know. And again, you're going to see that propagate into the future slides. Uh, dates, same problem. Uh, if you don't know the date or you don't want to date in a field, if you don't have null, what do you put there? You know, 1900, January 1st, uh, 1970, you know, all these crazy things that you have to do if you don't have nulls. And that's why we had to bite the bullet, and that's why we had to get the nulls. Okay? Um, and what I'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is basically explain 
how nulls get into your database, how they behave in various situations, and then give you an understanding so you don't get surprised. Uh, so you can kind of walk away and say, you know, I wish we didn't have need nulls. We do need nulls. Here's how they behave in these situations. I have to learn that as an application programmer. All right? This is a good question. Time for get any questions anybody has about sort of the groundwork I set and sort of the, the concepts that I covered. Okay, great. Okay, so let's uh, let's look at let's look at why we would use nulls. Like abstractly, what possible purposes would I have for a null? The, probably the most popular one is the unknown values. So you're inserting a row. You don't have information about all the fields you want, but you want to get part of the data in. This is very common in data entry. You know, you, you know the person's first and last name. You don't know their birth date. And you're going to come back later and fill it in. Well, we don't want to put 01011900 in there, okay? because then they'd be 113 years old, right? Uh, or, or some magical value that we then have to kind of scrape through our system looking for. The logical place to, to put an un, to, logical thing to use for an unknown value is a null. Okay? The second one is inapplicable values. These are values that aren't unknown, but are effectively um, don't apply to this row. It's not like I don't know the value. It's like I'm never going to fill that value in because the value doesn't exist. And I'm going to show you an example in the next slide. Okay? The third one is empty placeholders. And these are cases where you're doing some SQL, you've asked for a row or part of a row, and there's some values we just didn't supply, and what do you want us to put there? Okay, minus one, zero, 1900, no. We're going to put a null there. Okay, and, and I would argue that some have said that there, and, and this is kind of going to go berserk, but some have said that we should have, there should be three types of null in SQL. Okay, has anybody heard that before? Kevin? Yeah. Um, so this is a very interesting idea. And, and, and the reason it gets a little wonky is because the behavior that you might expect for a value that's unknown might be different than a value you expect in SQL if we were to, to, to go for what the logical way to handle it would be different for an inapplicable value. Okay, I know I'm getting like way out into space for some people. Okay, but but you kind of see that when you're overloading multiple purposes on a single value, then all, often by definition we can't generate a a, a <laughs> predictable behavior for these for this type of value. Okay, and I'm going to show you a lot of very unpredictable cases in the future slides. Okay, so here's an example that I think takes it home for me, and I don't know why I don't know where I heard this example before, but it's an example I've always used. Um, has anyone ever seen where this came from? Did I think about it up? I can't even remember. Okay, but it's the idea that you've got an employee table and you've got a spouse field. Okay, I don't know why you track the spouse name. Maybe for invitations to the Christmas party. I, I don't know. Whatever. Okay, you got to call them up to say the the, the spouse. I don't know. Is died. I, I don't know why you'd have it in there. But let's suppose you have a spouse field. So. <laughs> Those of you who are in my previous uh, tutorial are finding that very funny, and you should, because there is no hook on this to hold it on, so merely brushing by it is enough to send it launching to the floor. So uh, <laughs> employee.spouse. So here's the three examples of how we might use a null in this particular field. The first one is we don't know the spouse's name. You know, the employee's just hired. We didn't ask them the name. They didn't fill it out on the form. Who knows? We couldn't read. You know, we couldn't read the form, right? We couldn't read the name on the form. That's a great example. They filled it in, so we know they have a spouse, but we can't read it. We're not going to wait for them to, you know, we're not going to call them up. We just want to get the data in there, and we'll come back later. We'll put the spouse in, OK? Um, we would put a null in the, in the spouse field for that particular row. It means we don't know the spouse. Separate case would be the employee is not married and therefore has no spouse. You can see these are different concepts, right? We know we're not coming back, at least not in the next week, to put their spouse in because they're not going to get married in the next week. Okay. Um, the third case, and this is the empty placeholders, we do an outer join 
on the, on this, you know, the employee table, and we don't have a row there. Okay? I'm, not, I'm sure many of you have dealt with outer joins, but effectively, in an outer join, when there's a column that doesn't match, and you've got to put something there, you put a null there. Okay? So there's three uses of nulls, different, really distinct uses of nulls, that, 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 that we really are representing three different cases of we don't want a value in a field. Any questions? OK, great. So let's get into the meat of it, all right? First thing, don't use nulls if you don't have to. Um, I know there's some people who have kind of gone over the deep end with nulls. Um, usually, if you're using nulls too much, you start to get a lot of the unpredictable behavior that we talk about here. I even mentioned this two days ago when we talked about the not null constraint on a column. Remember that? I said, if you don't want a null, don't allow a null in the column. And frankly, I would say, and, and we had a discussion of what percentage of columns probably could be not null, but maybe you know, 80% of your columns probably should be not null, meaning just don't, give, don't let a null get in there. Like customer name, if you don't know the customer name, you probably shouldn't be entering it into the system, right? We can get away without an employee spouse field just fine. But if you don't know the name of the employee, don't put them in. And, and you start to get into some constraints of preventing the nulls. Okay, so example I had here is actually if you've ever used pliers to take off a nut, um, surprisingly there are, there's virtually no picture of this nut, you know, grinding pliers problem on Google. Um, I would love somebody to email to me, but that's the only one I could find. Um, so the point is that nulls are to be used only in special circumstances. They're not really to be used when you can avoid using them and because of some of the behaviors that we talked about. OK, um, warning. Uh, this is actually from CJ Date. Um, again, um, <clears throat> Kevin Gritner, who gave a talk previously, um, actually talked about, uh, the, about uh, COD and, and how there, he thought there should be three nulls. Here's the other sort of father of SQL. And he's basically coming out and saying, um, don't use nulls. Uh, although it's, it's a little nuanced there. Um, I, I, but, he's, but he's being really honest. Uh, in the writer, is this writer's opinion that nulls, at least as currently defined and implemented SQL, are far more trouble than they're worth and should be avoided? Uh, they display very strange and inconsistent behavior, can be a rich source of error and confusion. So if you've ever been confused by it, it's not, it's not you, OK? It's nulls. <laughs> it's, not, it's not your fault that you're confused. Um, and he's, basic, he's basically saying, um, I will urge you not to use them. Uh, which seems, but I will be, seems contradictory because I will talk it. I think of null as a drug. If used properly, it works, but abuse it, it can ruin everything. Uh, best policy is avoid nulls and when you can and use them properly when you have to. That's, that's actually Joe Selko, who actually spoke at Prague and at Austin uh, Postgres events, very well known SQL guy. Um, SQL for Smarties is the book that he's talking about. He's basically very honest that, you know, this is really weird. It's not a great system. Um, we have to live with it for the reason of the pliers thing, but it's it's reason we're talking about today. So um, I'm going to have a lot of queries in this text. Uh, what I've done is highlight the part you should look at in red. So everyone seems to remember this uh, picture just fine. So when I go to this picture, everyone's like, ah, I see where I'm looking. Um, so that's what you should be looking for, the red. Uh, so effectively, let's walk through some queries here, and let's look at exactly what type of behaviors I'm talking about and see if we can at least get a mental framework of how bit nulls behave in various circumstances. OK, any questions? OK, OK. So first, first, um, first thing you can do is you can select a, a, a literal null value. Just select null, works just fine. As you can see, nothing shows up there, which is maybe not good. Um, what you can do in PSQL is you can ask PSQL to show you null with a certain string. And I've done this throughout the rest of the presentation because, frankly, showing you nothing really doesn't help you. OK? <laughs> it's, it's confusing. Uh, like, we don't have enough confusion. We've got to add that. So effectively, here, if I do select null, I get a null string there. It tells me that's a null. It's not, it's not five. It's not six characters. It's really a null value. OK? So if you see that null in parentheses, that's what you're looking at. All right. Um, okay, so first example, 
Uh, we create a table called null test. We insert a literal null into the field, uh, again, assuming we don't know the value or the value doesn't apply. And then we do a select from the table, we literally see that, that null appearing. Um, nothing surprising there. Okay. We put a null in, we got a null out. Uh, second case, um, here I'm inserting into the same table. And here's the first case where we implicitly add a null. Okay. You don't see any null up here, do you? No, there's no null there. But when you look at the output, you can see row 2 also has a null, just like row 1. So here I explicitly add a null. Okay, there's a null right there in red. This one doesn't have a null. How did I do it? I actually supplied the columns in the table I wanted to insert. So the table has columns x and y, super creative of me. Um, I've told the system I only want to insert into column x. What's the system going to use for value for column y? No. And that's exactly what it does. So here we've actually implicitly, and Mr. Phil, who I don't think is here. Is he, Robert, is he coming? No, OK. So anyway, Phil had uh, the idea of sort of showing this. I think it was a comment that he had, he had suggested um, in the thing. Uh, no, actually, that might be, take that back. That is a mistake. It shouldn't be there. Sorry about that. I will fix it. Uh, th that's actually from a previous presentation, and I, I guess I didn't delete that part. Have to know exactly, exactly. Um, so let's get. Let I talk to you about the ability to specify not null in your fields. Okay, that's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm saying that my new table cannot have a null in the first field and cannot have a null in the second field, and I've now blocked out nulls from getting in inserted. I've knocked it. I prevent it from explicitly getting at it. And I prevent it from implicitly getting at it. Is everybody with me on this? OK. So by blocking nulls at the two columns explicitly, implicitly, value doesn't get in. All right. Let's start to look at what happens when you have a null. So we've talked about getting nulls into the system implicitly, explicitly. Let's talk about like what happens. How do you, how do you manipulate a null? What happens if you try and add one to a null? For, so here I'm adding one to a null. Um, the result is null. So it isn't one. It isn't zero. It's null. Because an unknown plus one is still an unknown. OK? And this is maybe confusing, but that kind of makes sense. OK? And you have to sort of prepare yourself for that. I'm going to show you some other cases a little later on where it starts to really get crazy. This kind of makes sense. But, but if you start to extrapolate this into some other cases, it starts to get crazy. Okay? What if I concatenate a null with an A? I don't get an A. It doesn't act as a zero length string. It's a null. Okay? And the same thing if I concatenate the other way, it's also a null. So either way, it's going to be null. All right? And this kind of makes sense. If you start to create a sentence and you're concatenating stuff together, one of the fields is null, all of a sudden the whole thing becomes null. Very surprising sometimes. <laughs> Right. Um, here is a little different case, I'm kind of setting things up here. So I'm creating a table called ink test, which is an increment test. Okay, I insert 30, 40, and null into it. So I'm kind of prepping my table. Okay, uh, then I add one to it. So okay, 30 becomes 31, 40 becomes 41, and then null is still null. Right? Follows what we talked about here. Right? We're good. Um, let's talk a little bit about the about comparisons. Now, this is this is operations. This is concatenate and increment. Yes, sir. you have a question? Yeah. Um, so, what you did, uh, like a, a sum of the product, I am getting there, okay. and it it will be crazy. Yes, it's really not pretty, but I have to do it. Um, so if I start to look at comparisons on nulls, we start to get some interesting behavior as well. So if I say, is null equal to 1? Well, that's easy. That's null. And, and notice it's not false. It's null. And that's where you start to get into another sort of twisty passage of nulls, is that when you normally think of comparisons, you think of Boolean logic, Boolean being true or false. 
when you're starting to look at nulls, you have, uh, when you, you deal with SQL, every comparison is actually a three value logic. It can be true, it can be false, it can be unknown or null. And there is some very unusual behavior that you start to see in later queries where that unknown doesn't even behave like false. You're like, wow, okay, so be prepared, this is coming, okay? Um, is it equal to one? No. Is it equal to a zero length string? No, it might display as a zero length string to the user, but it's not the same as a zero length string. Does null equal null? Right? Now here's where you start to here's where you start to get the twisty little passages all alike, right? So does null equal null? Actually, we don't know. Um, because the null, one null could have come from someplace, the other null could have come from someplace else. It could be two rows that are both null or they equal. We don't know. Right? Or that's kind of the logic that they're having here. You can select if null is null and it's true. I'm going to get to that. Yeah. So but this is comparing a literal value of null to some other literal value of null, right? This kind of really crazy. Um, again, as I said, there's some extrapolation that starts to go in. When I said null plus one is null, I said we're going to see a case where you start to extrapolate that out. It starts to look kind of weird. Is null less than null plus one? Well, you know, I went to math class. Um, null less than null plus one is probably true. Unless the two nulls are different and came from different places, at which point I don't know. Okay? And that's the way, that's basically the tack that the SQL standard committee says is that those two nulls could have come from different places, be on different rows. They aren't necessarily the same null. Um, because again, if you think of adding rows, you have a column that represents weight. You know, so it's like, I'm one pound, I'm five pounds, I'm 10 pounds, I'm 20 pounds, different parts, right? What if you have two rows that have null weights? Well, that means the part, part, the first row might be 1,000 pounds and the second row might be 2,000 pounds. You don't know, okay? So the, the concept here is that because I've got two nulls, I can't assume that they're the same value as I would if the two weights were 10 pounds and 20 pounds. I know those are, this, I know what those values are, right? So even something that logically you would think would be true comes out as null um, or unknown. So um, query comparisons, um, here's where it starts to get interesting. Select one where true, that's going to return a row. Select one where false, that's not going to return anything. That's not a null row, that's nothing. Select one where null returns nothing. And in fact, somebody argued, and I think this might have been a comment, I can't remember. Um, somebody said the where clause should be called like the sure clause. Like, are you sure it matches, right? Because effectively, um, effectively where, retur where only returns a result on true, not on false, and not on null. And here's where you get that three value logic thing going on, okay? So um, let's take a look at the and and or kind of case. Uh, true and null is null because we don't know if the null is true or not. That kind of makes sense. Um, select not null, the inverse, the opposite of null, is of course null, right? Uh, again, a little surprising there. I guess we don't know if it's true or false, so we don't know if it's true or false, nodded, and therefore it's unknown. All right. Um, no operator comparisons. Again, I'm kind of coming back here to look at some of the row comparisons. So we're really combining, in my mind, we're combining these tests, okay, the operator test that we went through, and the where clause test that we went through. And I'm going to show you combined, okay? So now I'm back to my ink test table, 30, 40, and null. Very easy to understand, right? Three, three rows. I want all the rows where x is greater than 0, 30, 40. Good, makes sense. I want all the rows that are less than 0. Mm, nothing. There are no rows here. Nothing's, nothing, we don't know. Right? Because null is, we don't know. Right? I want all the rows that are less than 0 or greater than or equal to 0. Now, that's a real tough one not to say a null, a null should match. But it doesn't. 
because again, this returns a null, this returns a null. The result is a null. It goes into the where clause. The where clause says, I only return on true. And you get nothing. Okay. <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like zero times zero times. I almost think of it as multiplication with a zero. Like as soon as you multiply, you can have a billion, and as soon as you multiply by zero, it's zero, right? So when you start to chain these things together, any of these results that return null, it kind of just it pollutes the whole expression. And the expression, no matter how long it is or how much we try to kind of narrow it down, and it just, it's, just, it just polluted the whole thing. Um, and and, and, and one, of the argue, one of the criticisms of nulls is that effect, that, that a null has a tendency to pollute itself way beyond the column it's in, you know, and, and just starts to spill out all over the place and, and, and has a very negative or very surprising consequence in areas you might not have suspected. Um, another case, um, give me all the values that aren't 10. That's easy. Give me all the values that are 10 or 10. Aren't 10 or 10, right? So either you're 10 or you're not 10. No, my null is not there. OK? Again, that, that sort of pollution effect uh, across expressions. Uh, no, where, where it starts to get a little confusing is the not in clause. And I'm going to kind of show you an example of it expressed out. So if I'm doing a comparison, I'm saying 1 isn't 2 and 1 isn't 3, well, that's true, because 1 isn't 2 and 1 isn't 3, right? OK? If I do an, a separate comparison, 1 isn't 2, 1 isn't 3, and 1 isn't null, then I get a null. Because I don't know if that isn't uh, that null. It might be a 1. I don't know. So if we, if we convert that, OK, so I say select A in null. I get what I would think of as a null, because effectively that's not in We don't know. Okay. But if I say A is not in a row that's just a null, again, I get a null. So what, what a lot of times you have to take away is that a lot of times people say, well, my in clause, I understand nulls are going to prevent that from matching. But my not in clause, well, that shouldn't have a problem. They think of it as the negative. So, I'm going to get all the rows that are in a certain set and all the rows that are not in a certain set. And the two, two results together should be the full set. That's, in my mind, that's the way I'm thinking, right? I got everything that's in this group. I get everything that, you know, I get everything that's in A. I have everything that's not in an A. Combine those two, I should get the original group. And that, what I'm saying is with nulls, that is no longer true. Because nulls mean that I might have some things that are in the group, I don't know it. Null, not in the group, I don't know it. Null. And they don't show up. And a lot of times you spend time debugging queries trying to figure out why I'm missing rows. And a lot of times the null is the culprit. Uh, a little more <coughs> expanded example. So is A in A or null? Now this one actually works because we're saying is A in a result that's an A or a null, what's in the A? So we're done. We don't have to look over here because we know this matches. And we go like, OK, true, good, we're go. Okay. Not in is where it bites everybody. And I'm, I'm not going to get a list of hands bitten, but not in always is a thing that gets people with, not, with nulls. So is A not in A or not in null? In fact, this one works because you know that A is in A. So you can return false. Okay, You're good there. Is A in B or null? I don't know. Here's the one that kills everybody. Is A in B or a null? I don't know. And a lot of times people do sets and they'll say, give me everything that isn't, you know, uh, you know, give me everything that's like less than 100 or whatever. And then all of a sudden there's all these rows that don't show up and they can't figure out why. It's because they've got nulls in there. Okay. Um, in fact, it pollutes the whole system. So I could have 20 Bs over here. I could have thousands of rows. As soon as I get this thing, the not in just says, I don't know. It doesn't return anything. Okay. So it, it, it really can get you. Really can get you. Um, 
Let's expand out the query. Is A equal to B or is A equal to null? This is the, the bottom two queries expanded. Is A in B or is A in null? I don't know. Is A not in B and is A not in null? Again, I don't know. This is, this is where you start to see the problem. Okay. Questions? Great. Okay. Um, explicit null comparison. Somebody already talked about this. I showed an example up here. Null equals null. Remember that? That's like, is null equal to null? It returns, I don't know. Okay. If you need to test for a null, you probably are explicitly going to need to use a special clause. Not equal null, but is null. Okay. Is null is null? Yes. This is where I'm mapping now my null to into the Boolean world. So I get my null out of the three, lo three valued logic world and is null basically pulls it into the Boolean world when I know my result's going to be true or false here. All right? Same thing with not in. Is null not in? Is select null is not null and it's false. Yes, sir. The keyword, <laughs> the keyword is is null. So the is is not something you can use on its own. No, you don't. It's always is null. Good question. Um, and and again, this pulls it out. So for example, if we could, when we're trying to do something like not in, a lot of times what you will end up doing. Is, is burying an is not null test in your subquery to prevent this type of comparison. So what they'll do is they'll say, you know, select null and they'll say where column is not null. And they'll prevent the nulls from propagating up into this result set and therefore the not in will properly evaluate by extracting out. Do you know what I'm saying? So for example, if you want um, you want all your customers who are not in Pennsylvania. Okay? Um, you would say, maybe you want to select all your customers here. I don't know, for whatever reason. If you have some customers that are null, you're not going to get any rows back. Because it's like, well, customer's not in, and it's a list of values is null, so therefore it's not going to match. So a lot of times what people do is they'll say, is not null, and they'll prevent the is not nulls from, the nulls from getting up into the target list and being seen by the is not null. I know it sounds like I'm gibbering, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you, you prevent the, the nulls from getting up at the target list, and therefore your, your, is null, your, is, your in or your not in now behaves logically that, that you might not have been able to do before. Okay? Did you say the yeah. backwards Yeah. Using is is not a reasonable approach to getting good performance in the lab, so you're not putting the value into the data. I don't think performance really ever enters into the use of, of is null and is not null. It's more um, of a desire to exclude nulls from, from polluting out into the rest of your comparisons. That's really where I think the win is. Um, because as I showed you with concatenation and all these other things, and not in and in and, and 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 so forth, a lot of times the way that null propagates, it's this sort of polluting thing that sort of wants to spread uncertainty through the whole expression or even up into the upper query. And a lot of people who know I've got some data that I don't want to process, okay, um, uh, they'll, just, they'll just say, you know, pro, you know, they'll just exclude anything that has a null in the field they're working with. And that really is the filter that prevents it from going out and up and causing sort of unpredictable behavior. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, that references the case of those don't optimize as well as, for example, uh, not exists. The semantics are different, but not in, in some cases optimizes very poorly for subquery. Okay. But it's not unique to nulls. It's, it's a behavior of the... It's usually a number of elements. Okay. Right. Um, 
So uh, if we go now to this test, it starts to make a little more sense. We're kind of bringing things together here. So we have our three rows in ink test. Okay. <clears throat> we can say select star where x is null. And I'm now pulling out just the null rows. Okay. And now select ink test where x is not null. And I'm pulling out the non-null rows. So as I said before, you think, of your, you think of your result set as here's all the ones that are in, here's all the ones that are not in. Combined, that should be my full set. You should probably have a third version which says, here's all my ones that are in, here's all my ones that are not in, and here's all my unknowns. And, and you now have to think of having a third set of values which combined with the first two will give you your original set. Okay, That's when I, a lot of times I remember when it was an application program say, Give me all the positives and then give me all the non-negatives. I mean, I don't know what it is. Give me, all the, give me all the negatives and then give me all the non-negatives, right? Zero and positive, right? And I would think that would be my whole set. And I'd have two queries. I would say all the negatives, I'm going to do this with it. All the, all the non-negatives, zero and positive, I'm going to do this with it. And I wouldn't process all my rows. I'm like, really? And <laughs> it's like, I, got a, I don't have not null in that column. So therefore, I've got nulls in that field. And now, all of a sudden, I have to be, I have need a third block, which is going to say, give me all of the null rows values for that field and do something special with those. And that's why I think a lot of the concern you saw earlier in the quotes, people saying, ah, don't use them, right? I mean, be careful when you use them, because now, all of a sudden, your logic has to be, you have to now think when you're doing these type of queries, how is a null going to behave in all these situations? A lot of cases you don't care. You know, give me everyone in Pennsylvania. You don't want, you don't care if they're not in Pennsylvania or they're not, in, they're null. They're just not in Pennsylvania, right? In most cases you don't care. It's usually when you're trying to split up your result set into two parts. Like, give me all the Pennsylvania people, give me everyone who isn't in Pennsylvania. That's when you usually get caught, right? Because there is that set that isn't in Pennsylvania or not in Pennsylvania, yes? Yeah. Null is about the only choice I've seen with that. Other words, where you're going to use one, one, eighteen hundred, or something funky. How do you how do you deal with that recasting that field of string, making it something other than null so you can cast it? Oh, glad you asked. Um, I'm actually about to get to that. I have I actually have some commands specifically for that case. I think I have one more slide, uh, two more slides. Okay, so. Um, Another, remember I told you about null, is null, and null, OK? There's another clause that we have, which is a little different, called distinct. Distinct's a little hard to get your hand around, but it allows you to test for whether a value is either, this, either different from or null, and it returns a true. For example, I'm saying is null is distinct from 1. Is it, with Lillian, what it means is, is it, is it, <coughs> Is it 2 or is it just a null? And both of those in distinct land are different from the 1. Okay? And I'm sorry, I've actually, I think I've distorted it by using a 1 here and a 2 here. So my, apolo <laughs> my apologies, I shouldn't have done that. Um, effectively, here I'm saying, is 1 different than 2? Yes, it is. Okay? Is null different from 1? Yes, it is. Okay? Is null different from null? No, it's not. Okay? So what this allows me to do is instead of doing an equality comparison with a value, null equals 1, which obviously returns null, if I use is distinct from, it's effectively saying, are you not equal to that value? And if you're null, you're still not equal. Okay. Um, I realize I don't like the fact this is a negative. So distinct from is effectively a not equals. Um, and in fact, what's really crazy is there is a not distinct from which is effectively equals. So I don't like that. I don't know if I could have thought of a better solution. Um, but effectively, it allows us to do comparisons between nulls and potential, between, between nulls and potentially non-nulls, OK, where we say a not equal or an equal with a null returns false. OK, so if you need to do quality, unequality comparisons, 
Not is null. Is null is testing if it's a null. Right? That, that's pretty easy. But if you need to do a comparison between a column and something else, okay, distinct and not distinct um, are actually pretty nice to use. Although the negativity really throws me for a loop. Is that standard Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of got we kind of got stuck there. Uh, here's an example. So I'm insert. I got two columns. Uh, one, one, two, three, and null, and null. Okay, and I say is X, which is the first column, distinct from Y. Now, one is this not distinct from null. Yeah, one is not distinct from one, so we return it. Two is distinct from three, so we don't return it. Is null not distinct from null? I know it's like true, and I know it's. It, I just can't get my head around a lot of times. Um, but effectively, it allows us to, again, map that null behavior into a Boolean behavior, which is only going to be true or false. Right? So think of it as mapping that what we normally return a null for equality comparisons into a true or false that you can then work with. Particularly, this is useful for joins. Because you know, in your application, you can say, oh, it's null, I'll do this, or not equal. But if you're joining two columns, and some of them might be null, this distinct from can be very helpful. So the is operator is only for nulls? Is it read uh, If you look at the grammar, um, I don't even think we have an is operator. It's like, is it actually has to be those keywords in that order. Uh, yeah, where well, there's is, optional, not, distinct, is, optional, not, null. Um, it's, it's really, there is no is uh, alone without either null or, I guess you could say it is for, it's for null sort of behavior checking. Makes sense. Yeah. I, I can see that. Yeah, you can say is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're right. You, you could. do like integer, temp integer, or the same as both. Ooh. So maybe it's only for Boolean? Maybe? Because you're right, is both of these return booleans, is null and you can say false is true, and that'll work. So you're right, is I guess is an operator. Never thought of that. It's its own little thing. But you're right, integer e is integer doesn't work. Yeah. Um, let's take a look at ordering. Uh, ordering is a case where I think we 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 basically um, sort of discard a lot of the rules that we talked about already, and we make up new ones. Uh, so here we have a table that has a null, a 2, a 1, and a null. It looks just like this. Okay. Um, what you're noticing is that these nulls are now all the way at the end. And when we talked about nulls equaling nulls, they don't. right? They always return null. Um, but when you order them, all of a sudden they're equal to each other. Magic. right? Um, and the reason that they do that is because they, they, they really couldn't do anything else. right? Sort of randomly sprinkling the nulls in the ordering really wasn't going to do anyone any good. So effectively, you just had to fall back and say, well, what's the practical behavior that would make the most sense? We'll just put the nulls together, even though they don't equal each other. And we've hounded that to people and beaten it into their heads all this time. Okay? Um, I think technically what they would say is that you get the, you get the unknowns at the end. Right? So the unknowns just seem to come at the end. Um, same thing, we can actually specify the nulls to go first, and we can control and say we want the nulls to come first. Okay. Um, similar to indexes, we, we throw the baby out a little bit, or maybe not, I don't know. Um, we're, 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 we're sort of heading into crazy land here. Um, so if I create a unique index, uh, I can actually put multiple nulls in that unique index just fine. Okay, because they don't equal each other, so therefore they're not they're, they're unique, I think, right? Um, so here I can obviously put nulls in there just fine. And I think there is a is it Oracle that only allows one null in a unique field? There is some. Yeah, there's some other databases that don't. I, I don't remember if we if the standard requires us to do this or we break the standard or I, I don't know. Um, we just thought it made the most sense to allow multiple nulls in a field in a unique in a unique field. Um, because, yeah, the idea that, that one null would equal another null doesn't make any sense, so they are kind of unique if you look at it sideways. Aggregates, I, I promise to bend your brain on this one. 
Um, again, uh, you sort of get a practical behavior that may not match what you saw before. Um, here we have a table. I'm putting in 7, 8, and null. OK, ag test, very easy to understand. Um, I'm going to just run a bunch of aggregates on this. Count star, count, and a field name. <laughs> Sum, min, max, and average. Um, when you do count star, it counts rows irregardless of the values in the row. Okay, so you get three because there's three rows there. When you specify a field in the count parentheses, then we only count non-null values. How convenient. Um, so in fact, we have two here because there are only two non-null values up there. Not very, um, uh, how do I say, um, not very obvious. That, that's what it would do, but you just have to put, burn it into your brain. Um, count star and count on a column actually have these different behaviors. Okay. Um, some, that's pretty clear. Well, 15, well, eh, not really, because 7 plus 8 plus null is null. Right? We talked about that in the earlier slides. But aggregates, throw that out, throw, just discard that, right? I would argue that just as count doesn't look at nulls in the field, sum and min and max and indeed average don't look at nulls in the field. Okay, And you just have to learn that. So the sum is 15. It's the sum of the non-null values. The min and the max make perfect sense. The average, again, you're only looking at two rows. So the average, eh, it's sort of 7.5. Odds are with the null in there, it really isn't 7.5. It's something else. And it really is null, to, in my mind. But I guess returning null for that field just wouldn't make a lot of sense. There'd be a lot of cases where you had to they say is not null all over the place for aggregates. So they just like throw them away. I'm sorry? Yeah, I'm dividing. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm even dividing by null, which just takes me to a whole new level. Um, What's also interesting, if I go delete the table and I just run the same query on empty table, I start to get reasonable values. I get count of 0, no rows, count, both of them are 0. I get a sum not of 0, which kind of surprises me, but null. And I think they did that because the min and the max and the average probably, the min and the max particularly would have to be null. You couldn't guess what a max of no rows would be, right? So they just kind of across the board said, we're just going to return all nulls if there's no rows there. Um, is that obvious? I don't know. No, I don't think so. But that's what they did. Um, put some rows back in there again. Now we're going to put two null value rows in the, in the table. Um, and we're going to run the same query um, with, a, with a group by. And this is where you know we're really out in space here, OK? Because as I said before, a null never equals a null. But you know, group by, it's like, hey, let's go. You know, we're all we're all together as nulls here. Okay. So just as the aggregate kind of had this weird behavior for nulls, group by, all of a sudden, all the nulls equal each other. Hey, there you go. Um, so my my takeaway is, don't assume aggregate with nulls is going to behave just as though you typed out the sum or the. You know what I'm saying? It, it's just not the same. Uh, it has some sort of super behavior. And it doesn't even ignore nulls, which we could understand here we're ignoring nulls. I get that. OK? But, but wait, when I do a group by, nulls are now good citizens again. And they are all equal to each other. Right? This makes no sense at all. And I don't pretend it makes sense. And I don't think the committee even pretends it makes sense. They sort of punt and they say, well, we think this is the most reasonable behavior. OK? Even though it's quite inconsistent even from the previous slide. Yes, sir. Yes, internally they'd have to use as null to make that work and then sort of put them in their same bucket. Yeah. So the, the rows, the 7 and the 8 is pretty easy. Um, if I do a count star, this is really, really interesting. If I do a count star on my null rows, I get 2. But if I do a count with the x there, I get 0. Because remember, the count with the field in there ignores the nulls, even though the group by is clearly processing the nulls, right? 
Um, and I have a sum of null, which makes sense, and a min and a max and average all null. That, that part I get. Okay. Um, mapping nulls to strings. This is what the gentleman in the green shirt asked about and dates and things. Again, there are some cases where the nulls are just going to propagate. How do I concatenate something that has a null? You know, this is driving me crazy, right? Um, we do have a, two commands. One is called coalesce, OK? Um, and what coalesce does is basically it says if it basically allows you to have as many, and I'm using a very simple example, but it allows you to have as many, as many parameters as you want and will return the first non-null parameter. Crazy definition, frankly. I, I, it's like the non, it's like the distinct being not equal to. It's like throw as many parameters as you want and I'll give you the first non-null one. I don't know why anyone would want more than two, but they support it. What I'm basically doing here is I'm saying if the first field's null, return a zero. That's pretty stupid. If the first field's null, return that string. I am null. Good. Okay. That's what we could use for a date. We could say if, here's where we're, we're where we've got an f, a g, and a null in a table. I'm going to say, instead of returning x, I'm going to return coalesce of x and na. Not applicable. Not unknown. In this case, I know null means not applicable. Don't ask me how I know that. I'm just saying. I, in this case, I'm saying not applicable. Yeah? If you do a where plus, it'll use the, the previous table value, not the coalesce value. Right? <clears throat> if you do a where clause, you're going to get x. You're not going to get the coalesce. Yeah. If you want the coalesce, you have to duplicate the coalesce in your where clause and then compare that to a string. That would work. Yeah? If you name the coalesce, the problem is the way that SQL is executed, it's everything from the from down and then the target list. So the names are typically not accessible only at the end of the query. Now, there are some cases where that's not true, particularly in order by. You can, I think, reference the column names that you specify. But in the where clause and the from clause, you don't have access to those names up there, unless Postgres did something wonky. But Typically, those names are really for display only and kind of also for group by and order by. And again, I'm not proud of that behavior, and I think it was defined that way by the standard. So we're kind of stuck. But it's, again, a very inconsistent behavior, I think. Because I tell people, well, the target list is only evaluated at the end, but then you can mention the, in Postgres, I believe you can mention the, 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 the aliases in the order by, but you can't mention them in the where clause. Crazy. Um, I'm not proud of it, but I think we did the best we could. I think that's what it was. So um, here I'm getting NA in my field instead of null. So this would be what we use for my date. Um, here's another case. Here's my exact case. I want to concatenate, OK, three fields. And, I, and this one, if there's, if there's a null there, I just, want, I just want single quotes. So I would normally put the column here, the column. Instead of a null, I'd have a column, and I'd say, if that column is null, give me zero, zero length string. OK, it would just disappear. If it was null, it would just disappear. Until the next man actually gave me a case where it was null. Great. And this one is kind of a fix for the previous one. So remember I said that when you do a sum on a column, if it's null, you get, zero, you get like null. So basically what I'm saying is if you do a sum, and the sum returns null, I want a 0 there. Okay, It allows you to kind of whack around this thing so you don't get a null here. for right. So I'm, I'm kind of combining areas and coalesce there to make it work. Okay. Um, mapping strings to nulls. This is the opposite. So instead of taking a null and mapping it to a string, I'm going to map a string to a null. So here I'm saying null if, if x is null, uh, no, 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 what am I saying? Return null if x is equal to that string. So now I'm, instead of taking nulls and wanting strings out, I'm testing for strings and I'm having nulls come out. Okay? So this is, remember, nulls in, string out is coalesce. String in, nulls out is null if. I still can't remember them sometimes. Um, but basically, what I'm saying here is I'm saying if x is null, uh, no, if x is na, return a null. In fact, I'm doing that right here. I'm actually explicitly putting in na. 
This is the uh, sort of combined. So I'm taking a null, converting it to taking a null, converting it to NA, and then NA is going to match that. It's going to return a null. So I'm doing both in and out, just as an illustrative, confusing thing that I just like to do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, you, the, 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 you could argue the problem was that there should never have been nulls in that column I summed in the first place. Yes, you definitely could do that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Or it's a yeah, it's an outer join which would you can't avoid that. That's where it, that's where you start to get some interesting stuff. Um, a little bit to wrap up. Um, we we also support row expressions. Again, there's some pretty unusual behavior here. Um, is a null integer array null? Yes, it is. Is an empty integer array null? No, it isn't. Um, is a null inside of an integer array null? It is not. Okay. Um, getting a little crazier, we have row expressions. Uh, is, row an, is an empty row a null? Yes. Is a row containing a null null? It is. Is a row containing two nulls a null? It is. Is a row containing a null and a non-null null? It is not. Um, is a row containing a null and a non-null not null? It is not. <laughs> OK? Uh, and then is one or two is not null? That's true. So effectively, the behavior is if there's only nulls in there, we can return true. We, we know what it is. If there's only non-nulls in there, we re can return true. We can test it. If there's a mix, we're going to return false. Just, just that's the way it did it. Um, just, yeah, that would, that would kind of clean it up. Um, another case where if you have an empty table in your select clause, that effectively return a null row. I know that's kind of weird, but every, it's assumed that every select clause in a target list is going to return one row. If it doesn't return any rows, we will effectively throw a null in there. Uh, and this is a surprising behavior, I think, and something somebody had, had noticed on the email list a while back. So uh, I think I get it. No, you don't. Um, it's, really, it's really a crazy mix of behaviors. Um, Jeff Davis, who you, you will see walking around, very nice guy, um, uh, he says, uh, you know, he, he had a blog post, and I pulled this out of there. He said, oh, that makes sense. When you see individual behaviors are null, they look systematic, and your brain quickly sees a pattern and extrapolates what might happen in other situations. Often, that extrapolation is wrong, because null semantics are a mix of behaviors. I think the best way to think about uh, null is as a Frankenstein monster of several philosophies and systems stitched together by a series of special cases. And I think I have adequately illustrated that here. Um, I wish there was a systematic way I could present it to you, but for practical reasons and because of the way the SQL standard has defined it, it is a Frankenstein of behaviors. Uh, but hopefully this presentation has helped you to identify that, not to feel like you've missed the boat somehow, um, and to realize that when you see nulls in different circumstances, you can now sort of map how you would think those would behave. And with that, there's nothing left to say. So uh, thank you very much. Um, the actual, <laughs> the actual series of blog posts is right at this URL. So if you want to share this pane with your friends, um, you can actually look at the original blog, 11 blog post with text um, that explains it to you. And of course, this entire presentation is at that URL right here. So uh, I think we're a couple minutes late. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to take questions. We did take some during the class, and I thank you for that. I believe lunch is being served right now.